With the dominance of humankind has come a new age, an age of global warming, ecological collapse, and a sixth mass extinction. In 2018, it was reported that of all the Earth's mammals, 96% are humans and livestock. Our overpopulation, overconsumption, and exploitation have caused a climate catastrophe, but we are not our only victims. Each year, over 70 billion land creatures and 7 trillion sea animals are killed for food. And despite growth in public awareness, the overwhelming majority of these animals continue to endure unimaginable suffering. The religions of ancient India, Hinduism, Jainism and Buddhism are no strangers to practicing Ahimsa and vegetarianism. Their Abrahamic cousins have a very different past. For the advocate of animal rights, Judaism, Christianity and Islam have a long and dark history in their treatment of our fellow creatures. A history many theologians want to condemn to the history books. One such theologian is David Clough, Professor of Theological Ethics at the University of Chester. Through his systematic theology on animals, Professor Clough has inspired a new wave of scholarship on Christian attitudes towards our fellow creatures and the earth as a whole, calling Christians to unshackle themselves from Aristotelian ways of thinking and embrace Darwinian theories of the natural world. Only then can the world be reconciled with God. As always, thank you to our heavenly mother and father, Cullum St. Gabriel's and West Hill Endowment for sustaining our creation, as well as all our loyal disciples for believing in the show. In particular, thank you to Dylan Kirby, Lily Hooper, David Ligeness, Mr. T, Jimmy Casperson and Jim Clare. If you're enjoying our existence and you don't want to send us to the afterlife just yet, please join Dylan, Lily, David, Mr. T, Jimmy and Jim and fulfill your telos. Support the show and head over to patreon.com forward slash the Pansycast to show your support. A link is also available in the iTunes description. In part one, we're going to be looking at the rise of the Veganjelicals. And in part two, we'll be engaging in some further analysis and discussion. And welcome to episode 75 of the Pan Sidecast. I'm the goat herding Jack Symes, and I'm joined once again by the man who preaches love for all creatures, but he can't resist a fishing trip with his friends, Dr. Gregory Miller. Hello. The man who lives on bread alone, Mr. Ollie Marley. <laughs> Hello. And the way, the truth, and the life for all creatures, Professor of Theological Ethics at Chester University, David Clough. Hello. Thanks for joining us on the show, David. It's a pleasure to be here. So we kick off all of our interviews uh, with a, the question, what is philosophy? But you're doing something links, but not quite philosophy. So what is theology and how does it link to philosophy? So Christian theology is thinking about God and the world in, uh, a Christ, in Christian tradition. The uh, theology is beginning to be used more widely. Uh, so we could begin to think about Jewish theology or theology within other religious traditions. Mm. Um, but Within Christianity, that's the task of trying to reflect on scriptural texts uh, and uh, later Christian traditions, try and think about how we uh, can speak coherently about that, uh, try and think how we receive those traditions and give an account of them in the world as we find it. Um, and then that could branch into lots of sub-disciplines of, of, of theological work. I mean, theology and philosophy have always been in dialogue. So the earliest Christian theologians were in dialogue with the Greek and Roman thinkers of their time. Um, and in a sense, I don't think they understood their work as significantly different from philosophy. It was it was philosophy uh, in a different context or Christian uh, uh, philosophy. And mm -hmm. so there's an important intersection, I think, where uh, Christians are you know, strongly invested in the task of thinking well. Um, and so you've got philosophical theology, which would be very concerned with you know, the consistency and coherence and uh, uh, metaphysical underpinnings mm. of uh, theological work. And it would also seem to me reciprocally that philosophers can't do their job well unless they're really seriously engaged with religious accounts of right. uh, uh, the world and to try and understand um, you know, their logics and sources too. Mm. So, David, what was it about theology that first kind of drew you to it? Why why theology? Uh, so that's interesting. I was raised Christian, so I've always been uh, faced with the sort of puzzle of how to understand the faith that I was inducted into, what it means to be a Christian believer in the context of the world as I find it. 
I started as an undergraduate studying natural sciences um, and thought I wanted to become a theoretical physicist. Mm -hmm. uh, but as time went on, the questions that I had got bigger and bigger. And I probably had some bad guidance about physics. I was told at one point when I uh, got uh, interested in the theoretical underpinnings of quantum mechanics. I was told, well, no, as a physicist, you just need to keep your head down and keep turning the handles and get the answers <laughs> out. And that was profoundly demoralizing mm -hmm. uh, to me. I suddenly realized that I could switch to theology and suddenly have the chance to pursue full time all mm -hmm. the questions that I was most preoccupied in delving into. So I was really driven to theology in order to ask bigger and bigger questions, I think. Can you give us some examples of these questions? What were the big questions? that were kind of in your head that actually maybe the sciences or your not so great physics teachers it sounds like what what couldn't they answer what were you interested in, in asking in relation to um quantum mechanics i was really interested in the way that it didn't really seem uh insofar as i was investigating it as a tender undergraduate that that those things would uh that the, the project held together theoretically. There wasn't a consistent account that could explain why quantum mechanics worked in terms of getting uh, results out. And so, you know, that was my uh, frustration there. And, you know, I could have pursued that within history and philosophy of science if I'd known better or been better advised. Within theology, I guess my driving question, well, I, I, work, in, I work in Christian ethics and that I think is an indication that my driving question has always been, well, what are the implications for believing the kinds of things that Christians do for how uh, we should be living in the world? Mm. And so I think that the deep roots of my theological interest has always been, what would it mean to go really deep, take really seriously uh, this tradition that's been passed on to me and uh, and and really follow through on what would it mean to to, to live that out? So you mentioned, you know, you an undergraduate and you're uh, interested in quantum mechanics and you get this bad advice. Um, but do you think then that, you know, in some other possible world, if things had gone differently, that's what you would be doing? So in other words, if you weren't, you know, uh, working on uh, theological ed ethics and, you know, theology more broadly, what do you think you would be doing for a living? <laughs> that's interesting. So... Uh, I think it could easily have gone uh, that I went, that I transferred to history and philosophy of science uh, and became some kind of uh, philosopher of science. That, I think that's one possible future. When I was in um, grad school doing uh, religious ethics, uh, there were certainly people on the philosophy faculty that were saying, "No, no, come over to the dark side and <laughs> and come and come and do with us. We think you could, you could do do a good job with us." So that was you know another possibility. In relation to my current work, uh, trying to get Christians interested in animals, I think of you know a kind of parallel career would have been mm -hmm. uh, just been some kind of campaigner or activist. Mm -hmm. I think more and more I'm really interested in what it takes to persuade people to change the way they live, mm -hmm. um, and that is. That you know that does pertain to academic ethics, but it it's also got sort of wider dimensions too. Following up on that question, we started asking this other question about our guest because ever since we had Rutger Bregman on last year, and he said, well, when he was an undergraduate, one of his professors told him that what he needed to do was go away and find an intellectual hero. Um, so what he did was he you know. Logged into Google, Googled intellectual <laughs> heroes, uh, scrolled halfway down the page, clicked one, and it just so happened to be Bertrand Russell, right? Um, and we also had, for the listeners, this will be sometime last year, but for us, it was only uh, last week. We were talking to Stephen Mumford. Oh, that's last episode. That's last week, two weeks ago for them. <laughs> Sorry, I'm not throwing you. <laughs> You've thrown me there. <laughs> sometime in the past, we spoke to Stephen Mumford and... Um, he said his intellectual hero is Socrates, because, mainly because of Socrates' is humility. Following on, on with this vein, is there any kind of um, intellectual hero that you've kind of set yourself up with or someone that you always tried to kind of aim towards uh, emulating or something like this or that always inspired you? Well, I did my doctoral work on a Swiss theologian called Karl Barth, um, who definitely uh, inspired me really very, very greatly at the at the time, because he was someone who seemed to connect uh, Christian theology, Christian spirituality, and Christian ethics in a way that I found uh, really captivating. Um, he had basically read everything um, and wrote these, you know, this, this huge kind of system uh, system of thought that you could find your place within and bring sort of any 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 questions to. I still get a lot out of my engagement with Bart, but I'm. Uh, you know, increasingly acutely aware that 
it's really important as an academic for me to be engaging with systems beyond uh, the sort of core white male uh, center of the Western philosophical theological uh, tradition. And so I'm really interested in deliberately diversifying the kind of sources I'm engaging with. The, the book that's most inspired me in uh, the last couple of years is a book by Afroism by uh, two uh, black vegan sisters, Syl and Afco. And uh, they're working about on the issue of how race and uh, concern for animals uh, relates to each other and how structures of human supremacy also map uh, very strongly onto uh, structures of white supremacy. And I think that's the most inspiring um, book that I've read in the last couple of years. Most of your work focuses on on uh, other creatures and ethic, Christian ethics relating to them. Um, do you think that you've mentioned a few different areas of interest there? Are you keen to continue your work in um, animal ethics? Or do you see yourself branching into completely different areas of theology or philosophy? So when I finished my PhD, I basically thought I had a, I'd done a PhD in sort of Christian ethical method. And then I had a laundry list of topics that I'd like to get to. So I co-authored a book on a debate between Christian pacifism and Christian just war theory, where I was taking the pacifist side. So I wanted to write about Christian pacifism. Animals was kind of next on my list. But I had a whole laundry list of other things that I wanted to get onto mm -hmm. too, like Christian engagement with welfare policy, oh, for brilliant. example, um, a, whole, a whole list of other things. Um, the animal stuff I've got stuck on. Mm. How long has uh, it been? How long have you been stuck on the animal ethics for now? Probably ten to twelve years okay. now, <laughs> um, and the reason for that is that. Uh, there was much work, more work to do than I realized. Mm. I really wanted to write a Christian ethics of animals, but I realized that I needed to go back and look at sort of major underlying uh, theological issues before mm. I could get traction on the uh, ethics stuff. It feels like I'm not letting go of the animal stuff anytime soon. Mm -hmm. It feels uh, sort of very timely and important to be trying to get attention to this particular issue. Mm. I am interested in going beyond that to think about how Christian theology looks different once you've paid attention to animals. And right. so I'm interested in thinking about how paying attention to creatures like animals uh, as a starting point for theology might make Christian theology look different. Mm. So I'm, so I'd, I'd like to sort of build out uh, towards that account too, but um, I think I'm going to be uh, working on animal ethics uh, for a little while yet. Mm. So David, as someone who spends a lot of time thinking about ethics and theological and potentially philosophical views, is there any theological or philosophical view you held when you were younger um, that you have later come to dismiss or any kind of change in your ethical output or kind of views um, throughout time? Mm, well, that's a really interesting question. Have you have you always been a... a um, first of all, are you a vegetarian? Because we're going to talk about animal ethics. Mm. We say you're a vegetarian or a vegan or a reducitarian, reducitarian. Mm. And is that something you've always... Is it reducitarian? You're going to help Reducitarian. reducitarian. Would you say you subscribe to any of these views and have you always subscribed to them? So... During my teenage years, I think I became increasingly sensitive to what was going on in relation to our treatment of animals. Mm. And then when I went to university, it felt like I was faced for the first time with a, you know, obvious individual choice about what I was going to eat. You know, mm. this was all in my power and I could I could make that choice. And so it seemed absolutely obvious to me at that time, as soon as that was a decision that was that belonged to me, um, I should stop eating meat. Mm -hmm. So I became vegetarian at age 18. Um, and over the last 33 years, I've, it took me a while to make the connection between veganism, so uh, the problems with um, dairy and eggs um, in addition to uh, meat. Uh, but um, And I went to and fro a little bit in relation to different sort of life circumstances, but I've been vegan for sort of most of those uh, 33 years, mm -hmm. uh, including the last uh, 12 or so. Was it um, like, I guess, secular or pragmatic motivations that first convinced you to change your diet? Or would you say it was theological? What came first, the, the chicken or the egg? <laughs> <laughs> um, I, it certainly wasn't explicitly theological in okay. terms of how I, how I saw it. It just seemed, it felt to me, this was a completely obvious choice. As soon as you begin to realize how animals were being treated as they were being raised for food, mm. it just seemed to me, well, there's something deeply wrong here. If I have a choice between you know, causing this kind of suffering and death and not causing it through my dietary choices, then it seems to me obvious what I should be doing. As I think about it now, though, I wonder if there was some deep spiritual ethical formation that came from my Christian tradition that made it 
seem like that kind of obvious thing. I'm particularly right. interested in the fact that John Wesley, who's the founder of Methodism, I'm a Methodist, mm. um, who founded Methodism in the 18th century, was was um, significant in being really concerned about animals. Mm-hmm. Uh, even as an undergraduate at Oxford, he was sort of writing about animal souls. He published books about animal theology. Uh, and then early Methodists, I was delighted to discover, uh, were famous for their concern for animals. Uh, so there's one uh, sort of 18th century account of a meeting where someone gets up to a letter fly out of the window mm-hmm. and someone comments, oh, look, he's going all Methodist. <laughs> uh, so, so I really sort of celebrate that sort of... Uh, connection with uh, Methodist forebears. And I do wonder whether there are sort of some deep bits of uh, religious formation that help me to see this issue uh, more quickly. Though I have to say, among contemporary Methodists, and uh, there isn't lo- lots of empirical evidence about that, I'm trying to, I'm trying to work on that. Part one, the rise of the Vegangelicals. So to start part one off, David, we're going to kind of read you uh, a passage here and have a think about this question, which we think is a really good starting point for this discussion. So uh, in a nutshell, much of your work focuses around a single central idea. To quote you directly, there is a huge abyss between how we treat animals at the moment and God's purpose for animals. So let's start at the beginning. Let's start with the book of Genesis. Uh, and to, to quote it directly, uh, the King James Version, of course. My favourite version. Jack's favourite version. Uh, and God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the fowl of the air, and over the cattle, and all over the earth, and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the ground. Be fruitful, multiply, and replenish the earth, and subdue it. So the first thing we really want to pick out here is this idea of dominion. Um, can you tell us what your interpretation is of dominion? What is dominion and what is it's kind of uh, what is it encouraging Christians to do? So I think that passage in Genesis is trying to so through Genesis one, uh, God's creation of a whole diverse creaturely world is uh, narrated. Uh, and then when we get on to uh, the sixth day, humans don't even have the whole sixth day to themselves. And so those few verses are trying to name what might be distinctive, I think, am- um, among, you know, when you look at humans among other creatures, and you've got two characteristics of that distinctiveness. You've got human beings uniquely as imaging God mm. um, in that text, and you've also got this task of dominion. Mm. And lots of people have seized on that idea of dominion in order to justify human uh, control, exploitation of uh, the wider natural world. Uh, And so certainly in the early modern period, when human beings are getting this unprecedented power Mm. over the rest of uh, creation, it's really striking that uh, people go to that dominion text uh, and to Genesis as a sort of divine mandate. So you're saying that kind of, so for some of our listeners may not be as involved in theology as ourselves. Um, So from this passage in the Bible, for most of human history, is it worth saying that a lot of Christians have interpreted that passage as human beings have dominion, which is a form of maybe control or a dominance over the natural world? Is that a fair statement to make? So they've certainly interpreted it as saying that humans have got this special responsibility. They've got some kind of authority, um, perhaps in some, some in some sense in God's stead, you know, linking to that image idea mm-hmm. um, and have a sort of role in which um, they are kind of responsible for ordering uh, things as they belong to other creatures. But I think we often rushed from the term dominion to the term domination. Mm. It would be a very good description of how we're currently relating to other animals to say we're, compl- we're dominating mm. in really improper ways. I don't think that domination is an obvious extrapolation from the Genesis text. Mm. Um, so I think often you know, my sense of what we've done with that text is we've taken a text which talks about a particular human role and we've used that to legitimize um, a human role which goes way beyond it. I mean, in particular, if we go to right to the end, a few verses later, the end of Genesis chapter one, God gives um, a, a plant-based diet to humans to eat. Mm. And so whatever that dominion meant within Genesis one, it didn't mean the right to take the lives of other animals for food, which mm. is really uh, striking. So I think we definitely need to avoid reading that text out of context as um, suggesting that 
Christianity or uh, or the Old Testament or the Hebrew Bible is you know just giving humans a blank check in relation to other creatures. Now the skeptic might say that if looking at that, um, let us make man in our own image. They're saying you can interpret it. Um, to you know, I think you've got this brilliant quote somewhere, which is something like, uh, "We are all on borrowed breath." Uh, something like that, saying that not only uh, human creatures, but all creatures have the breath of life given to them by God. And there's nothing special about humans in comparison to non-human animals. Brilliant thinkers from the past, so uh, Rene Descartes and uh, his discourses on method says that non-human animals are like billiard balls on the table. They're just cause and effect. They're just behaviorism alone. They're automatons. Um, and I think there's two reasons he gives. Other creatures can't use words or sign their thoughts. And the second, they act through the dispositions of their organs, not having knowledge. We've done episodes on Aristotle and the Nicomachean Ethics. Humans have this rational soul, and plants and animals have different types of souls. So Aristotle, Aquinas, Descartes, the Stoics, even people like Keith Ward today, um, says that all non-human animals are non-rational, and we're rational, and that's what separates us. That's how we're made in the image of God. These are some... These are the great thinkers of the past. Why should we think that they're, they're wrong in, in this uh, fundamental belief and what makes us different from non-human animals? So first of all, let's look at just this human fascination with the question of distinctiveness. It's mm -hmm. really, really striking to me that we are obsessed with thinking our way to an account of what makes us different. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, in, in, in a sense, that's a characteristic of the whole of Western, Western thought is, mm. is trying to think about this question about human distinctiveness. And so before we kind of rush on to good and bad answers to that, mm. I think there's just this phenomenon of wanting ourselves, wanting to sort of name our differentness and our separateness is, is striking in itself mm -hmm. um, and may not be um, a, a great thing. I mean, there, there are good reasons for thinking about distinctiveness. You know, if you're thinking about uh, in a Christian context, if I'm thinking about vocation, it would be good for me to think about okay, what does God want me particularly to do? What am I particularly well equipped to do? And I think there may be part of a sort of good trajectory of thought about thinking about human distinctiveness. Okay, if right. we're the kind of creature that we are, what does that mean for how we should be living? So I think that's 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 an appropriate thing. But a lot of the time, I think that distinctiveness has been sort of weaponized um, mm -hmm. in order to justify uh, the sort of poor treatment of uh, the non-human uh, world. Mm -hmm. And um, you know, we've also obviously been interested philosophically and theologically in, in distinctiveness within uh, the human and justifying male-female differences and mm. white-black differences in a very similar way. Right. So first of all, I think we need to be really attentive to, the, to the, just that task of, uh, you know, realizing that it's not necessarily a, an innocent thing to be mm. concerned with distinctiveness. The dangers aside then, mm -hmm. are we philosophically? Yeah. So so I think we need to just take, take these potential answers to the question one by one. So rationality as a human distinctiveness has got this long intellectual pedigree that goes at least as far back as uh, the Stoics. Uh, Christians uh, find some common ground with the Stoics. And so I think a lot of that gets imported. Mm. Um, and so very early, the move that Keith Ward is uh, still making to link rationality with the image of God is made in the Christian tradition. Here's, oh, here's a distinctiveness that the philosophers have been telling us about in terms of humans. Here's where the Bible talks about human distinctiveness. Therefore, the image of God must be rationality. Mm. Uh, but there are really, really bad reasons. Uh, uh, there are really, really good reasons for, for, for rethinking that connection. Mm. I mean, first of all, rationality is very clearly not the binary on, you know, rational or not right. question that people have often thought it uh, it to be. So within a human context, some humans are more cognitively able than others. Mm -hmm. And so it's a really significant uh, problem to think of high levels of cognition as the defining of uh, the human in terms of intra-human uh, ethics. As we begin to know more and more about non-human animals, it's just entirely implausible to think that rationality stops at the edge of the uh, of the Homo sapiens. Mm -hmm. We've got lots and lots of good examples of all kinds of animals being able to engage in rational thought to different degrees. Uh, one of my favorite examples is uh, an example with uh, an experiment they've done with uh, monkeys, where they would give monkeys a, uh, different kinds of reward for particular mm -hmm. kinds of work. And when they gave monkeys um, 
one monkey received a grape, which was a favorite kind of reward for doing a particular task. When they gave a monkey, another monkey um, had seen that and then uh, they gave him a lesser reward. He just basically went on strike uh, and refused <laughs> to participate in the game. Even And he turned down a, you know, a reward that he wanted mm -hmm. because it wasn't as good. It wasn't fair. Mm -hmm. And then they've even shown that happen the other way. Uh, monkeys going on strike because another monkey is being treated less favorably than they are and they're not prepared mm -hmm. to participate in an unjust system. So, so it's really clear that we need to deal with rationality as a continuum. Yeah. And so just the idea that rationality is a distinct, is a human distinctive uh, is implausible. Mm -hmm. Then we need to, we can go on to others. The, the Cartesian idea mm -hmm. that every creature other than humans is just operating like billiard balls is just a complete nonsense. And it led to really horrific experimentation um, on animals where the Cartesian uh, experimentalists were... Um, vivisecting animals and saying when people complained about the screams of animals they were saying oh ju that's just the kind of like the cogs of a mechanism yeah. squ mm. uh, squeak There's squeaking no real experience of pain going on there. Mm -hmm. and uh, i mean abundant evidence just makes clear that the continuities between our physiology uh, and our uh, cognition are very very strong between humans and, uh, and other animals in a mm -hmm. way that makes it entirely implausible that every other creature is operating on a completely different basis to us. I and mean, we, we could step through other ways of thinking about human distinctiveness, but the, the real moral I think we need to uh, learn from a whole range of failed attempts to speak well about this difference is that we seem to be doing something quite odd uh, when we're engaged in this distinctiveness and we're very apt to reach for just things that we want to celebrate and praise about being human and then sort of label them as what makes us different to animals. Right. You can even find that in you know contemporary political discourse. You know, it's, it's, it's great that we do X or Y because this is what makes human beings, you know, uh, raises human beings above all the other animals, whether that's, you know, all, you know, all kinds of ways. So I, I think the work that I've done has really trained me to, to be a little bit allergic anytime someone says, okay, here's the difference between right. humans and other animals. Excellent, David. So you highlight this distinctiveness, um, whether we just want to feel special, whether Greg just want to feel special because he's, you know, he's a homo sapien, he's more important than like a, a mouse, for example. Um, but let's, <laughs> we're talking about ethics. Let's talk about the nitty gritty, the practical. So, okay, let's just say Greg's a little bit delusional. He's just, just thinking he's more important. What practical difference does that make? How does that actually impact the world um, if all humans just believe themselves to be distinct from the rest of creation? So, I mean, I do think, I mean, I've, I've talked about reasons for second guessing the ways in which we have constructed this difference, but I don't want to deny that there is a particularity to being human mm -hmm. that, that is important to recognize. So I think we need to hold on to both things. Most of the ways in which we've constructed this difference are problematic. Mm -hmm. um, and there is a difference and we ought to find ways of talking about it better. Now, why does that matter? Because... Uh, I think we've often operated on the basis that only human interests count ethically and therefore nothing that we do to other animals is of uh, serious ethical consideration. And so mm -hmm. we've already mentioned Aquinas um, as someone who says, well, it doesn't matter uh, under under our duties in relation to justice or charity, you know, compassion or, or love, uh, animals don't count. They're, they're not rational, so they can't um, participate with us in the kind of community where justice and, uh, and charity matter. Imagine Daniel Kant said something uh, similar. Uh, animals aren't ends in themselves because they're not uh, rational and they're not able to participate in uh, this uh, moral community. Again and again, we've excluded other animals from moral consideration because of bad accounts of difference. Mm -hmm. um, and if we do that, we end up in systems where animal interests are completely uh, disregarded. And we can see evidence of that in the way that we're using animals in, in many different ways uh, right now. A lot of the philosophers we've just kind of mentioned are very Western focused, you know, Aquinas, Kant, Descartes. Um, I mean, if we have a look at kind of like religions from India, Hinduism, Buddhism, things like Jainism, vegetarianism is a part of the very central beliefs, um, you know, not causing harm to other beings, beliefs like Ahimsa, for example. Um, it's a very uh, ingrained cultural and religious practice. Uh, why is it, do you think, that kind of religions like the, like these it's such a fundamental part of their identity. Um, you know, everyone can talk about the stereotypes of like how cows are treated in India, for example. Mm. But Christianity, for example, doesn't have that same relationship uh, with vegetarianism, for example. Why do you think that may be? I really don't know the answer to that question. But one of the things I wonder is whether 
especially Judaism and Christianity, were formed in the in the early period in the context of other communities which w- did consider animals to be sacred and mm. part of what it meant to differentiate themselves from other religious traditions in their time. Um, so, you know, different neighboring tribes in the count- context of ancient Israel or Christianity in relation to Egypt was, you know, key mm. um, uh, distinguishing feature I, or the, you know, worship of a, a number of gods um, in sort of Greek and Roman uh context some of whom had to do with animals i wonder whether it was this idea about it was a sort of over differentiation mm. uh, that led to an emphasis on the non sacralization of animals in jewish and christian uh, context uh, whether that was an important part of what led christianity in, in particular in a, in a in a particular direction and and the culture like the uk we're in the uk you know the uk historically is a very uh you know a country that likes eating meat um you know it's been part of the culture is have you got anything to kind of say about this maybe more cultural aspect i guess uh, maybe a separate from the religion or? yeah i think it may be the case that we need to think together about uh dietary practice and uh theoretical uh ideas about animals and so in cultures where meat was playing a much bigger role in uh, the diet. Mm. Uh, it's Obviously, it's quite likely that you needed to spend much more time uh, justifying that and providing accounts of why that was an okay thing to do. Um, and I don't know how far it's the case in relation to uh, Jainism and Hinduism uh, that uh, a plant-based diet was, was much more obviously part of a contemporary repertoire mm. and was a uh, a choosable choice mm. in those contexts in a way in which it wouldn't have looked quite so obvious uh, in Western Europe. And and so paying attention to the way that our philosophy, theology and day to day, you know, realities of life mm. are, you know, co-determine each other, I think is a is a really interesting point to, to reflect on. So picking up on the point there of the, I mean, this innate tendency we have, maybe you might say, to differentiate this from this and differentiate this from this, you know, different religious traditions and then animals from people, etc. In keeping with the differentiation, in one of your papers, David, you know, not not animals, a perfect you know, example of a differentiation, you say, well, look, what we should think of ourselves is not not animals, i.e. animals, right? So we preserve the continuity between ourselves and uh, animals in nature, right? Uh, and one of the consequences of this, you say, is that, well, look, this kind of traditional idea of this, you know, the, the great chain of being in which we, atop we have, you know, God and then angels and then kings and then men and then women and et cetera, et cetera, so on and so forth. Well, this is, this is gone, right? And now I'm, 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 I guess we're all really sympathetic to this idea, but one of the things, the first thing that might, you might think arises, and you give some examples in the paper, is that the justification that for, for this kind of removal of this great chain of being and identification with animals, biblical justifications, let's say, and its relationship then to the kind of evolutionary theory, as you mentioned a moment ago. And the second is, well, what happens, someone might think, to those from those things in the great chain of being that aren't obviously animals but aren't obviously god so the you know the glaring one there is things like angels right so the first question is what's its justification um biblically biblically speaking sorry textually speaking and what happens to angels things like this so i'm really struck when you bring the animal question to biblical text and christian tradition to find Mm -hmm. that there's not quite what you expect. So there's not quite the same sort of human, non-human animal Mm. binary if you go back into uh, Christian scripture. In fact, you find that um, the term for um, living creature in uh, Genesis 2, for example, um, is used both about humans and in relation to other animals. <laughs> but the translators of the biblical text in English have been so uncomfortable about the use of the same term that they've translated it differently within a few verses in, in Genesis 2. And so there's lots of uh, good Uh, theological reasons for thinking about this fundamental division between God and creatures, and then for thinking about different kinds of creatures, including animal creatures of which humans are one. You know, examples of where um, in uh, biblical texts, uh, God uh, 
clearly sees human beings and other animals together. So often Israel and their livestock are sort of common subjects, both of God's blessing and God's judgment. Um, and in the kind of comic tale of Jonah, you know, famously swallowed by a whale, spat up and and so on. Um, Jonah in the end complains to God about why God isn't punishing uh, the people of Nineveh quite as thoroughly as Jonah really thinks they deserve. Um, and God says, um, well, don't you see there are lots and lots of people there and also many animals right at the end of uh, the short book of uh, Jonah. So again and again in uh, biblical texts, we see uh, humans and other animals thought together and even all kind of creatures as in all things that God has made thought thought together. So when the for some of the early uh, Christian writers in the New Testament are trying to think about the significance of what it means to say that God became human in Jesus Christ and uh, died on a cross, in the beginnings of the uh, letters to the Colossians and the Ephesians, uh, the writers say, well, what happened was that God was making peace, reconciling all things in heaven and earth mm -hmm. through this death of this man, Jesus Christ, on the cross. And so there's this kind of cosmic sense of we need to see this human, these human realities in this wider uh, creaturely sense. One of the things I think I'm trying to do theologically is to say, well, maybe we've just come across uh, you know, come accustomed to sort of modern thought patterns of of thinking about human and animal, uh, which are much more uh, divisive and discontinuous than the texts and theological traditions that we've received. And so putting human beings back in the context of this wider creaturely space and thinking again about our relationships to other, other creatures, which, as you say, has important resonance in contemporary accounts of evolutionary biology in terms of, you know, our relationships to uh, fellow creatures. That's seems a, re a really important theological word to speak with important ethical implications. And what happens to then, David, as well, things that aren't, you know, from this great, great chain of being, things that don't appear to be animals that st still appear to be, you know, in the, you know, existent beings, for instance, angels. I mean, that, lots of, how does that, how do they fit into the picture then? So I don't spend a lot of time thinking about mm. angels, although, as I, I mentioned, Carl Barr, and he has quite a lot mm -hmm. to say about uh, angels. Mm. Uh, but I think the one thing I would it would be an interesting starting point for me is to realize that even in that great chain of being, human beings are not the top creature. <laughs> so, so if we had been paying attention well to that, we would recognize that we kind of find our place as a kind of fair, you know reasonably lowly creature. You know, the the best of the earthly earthly lot. Uh, certainly not the pinnacle in terms of uh, importance or authority within this uh, wider creaturely space. But as you say, I think we need to deconstruct that idea that we could rank the value of creatures in this uh, linear way, like that great chain uh, suggests from God to muck and, you know, find the place of every uh, animal within that. I don't think it... I don't think it works that way. It doesn't work that way within the intrahuman space. We're pretty, I think we're pretty clearly committed to the idea that we can't rank humans in value from most important to least important, although we often treat humans as if we could, in particular groups of humans as if we could. Um, and I think we just need to think ourselves outside of that habit of, of, of that uh, hierarchical ordering and recognize ourselves fundamentally as one creature among many, which might not mean it's improper always uh, to prevent human interest in relation to others. I think we need to give an account of why it would be appropriate uh, to save you rather than a mouse if both of you were found, uh, you know, drowning in a canal in one of these, you know, <laughs> awful philosopher type uh, examples. I think, you know, I think we can give an account of why human, human beings should matter to other human beings mm. in relation to our ethics. But if we can situate humans in this uh, wider creaturely context, I think that raises very significant questions about cases where it doesn't look like a, uh, quite so much of a zero sum game. Mm. Uh, I, know, I know which one I would save. <laughs> <laughs> you, would, you would save the mouse, I imagine. I, the mouse. I didn't say that. No. Um, so, but what if someone wants to say something like this? The following. So, the, okay, look, we have this the Old Testament, right? And in the Old Testament, I get it's full of what you know kosher laws right so we have things like um you may eat animals that have a split hoof uh, and that are completely divided right or you might say oh you can eat uh fish as long as they have scales etc now someone might say well look that's an explicit statement right that says you can go eat this thing given this condition right i.e you might, you know, treat it as if it could be something used to, to better your ends and do not value it as something in and of itself, something like that. Does that make sense? 
It does make sense. So I, yeah, I do think that's an interesting question. And, and the, it raises the question of how we interpret these really complex set of uh, textual traditions. Mm. And first, I'm really struck that eating animals is an ethical question in both in the Old Testament Hebrew Bible and in the Christian uh, New Testament. So you're right that God does give explicit permission in Genesis 9 after the flood for humans to eat animals, but that's an overturning of the original ordering, which clearly seems to be preferable, that um, all all animals, including humans, were going to exist on a, a vegan diet. Just, just to give the quote, every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you. It's pretty explicit from God there as well, isn't it? It is pretty explicit, but then, interestingly, that doesn't turn out to mean quite what it means, mm. uh, quite what it seems to mean, because um, first of all, um, even in Genesis 9, there's this prohibition that you mustn't eat animals with their blood. Uh, mm. So this idea of blood as a commonality between humans and other animals, I think, the sort of life of the animal. And so it's almost like cannibalism if you were to eat the blood of animals, because mm. that's the sort of common life. And then, as Greg's saying, we've got this astonishing hedging around of um the permission to eat meat. So you mm. can kill animals for food, but you can only do it with this particular set of animals uh, killed in this particular place by this particular group of people in this particular way for this particular occasion mm. uh, for this particular purpose. And so, or at least, you know, that's the ideal expressed in the priestly uh, sort of texts uh, in, in the Old Testament. And mm. so you've got a practice of killing and eating animals, which is unrecognizably different from any kind of modern secular practice. Mm. You know, meat eating is is comparatively rare. It's done in this particular way. It's hedged about with all these ritual um, uh, prohibitions and uh, the meat eat, the meat is then shared and, uh, and and public, and instead we you know make slaughter private and uh, consumption uh, private uh, as well. Interestingly, in the prophets, uh, this practice of animal sacrifice is questioned, and so uh, the prophets say, uh, "Well, you know, God's not keen on this sacrifice uh, anymore. He, he doesn't want you to do that stuff. Uh, what what are all your sacrifices to me? Or when you kill an ox, it's as, it's as bad as when you kill a kill a human, as far oh, as God's yeah. concerned, and so." Animal sacrifice is is definitely there. It's understood to be part of an expression about worship of God, but it's controversial. But and it, and it clearly feels like some kind of second best. And so, Christian theologians, even those in favour of meat eating, often think of Genesis nine as a sort of creation mark B, mark mark two. You know, it didn't work out so well the first time, so we're going to try again. Give a little bit more license to human beings. Mm. Um, and then, as I say, eating meat is also um, controversial in the New Testament. Christian early Christians have disagreed agreements about whether or not you can eat animals in different circumstances. And then really interesting in terms of a Christian reception of that animal sacrifice tradition in John's gospel, when the crucifixion of Jesus Christ is narrated, mm. it's very, very clearly narrated in terms that are uh, reminiscent of uh, particular regulations for animal sacrifice. Mm -hmm. So John's gospel seems to be saying Jesus's death is an animal sacrifice, uh, and perhaps the culmination of this sacrificial tradition, sacrificial tradition after which we don't need to be sacrificing any more animals. Mm. He's literally referred to as the Lamb of God. Um, mm -hmm. So, okay, so let's kind of just recap a little bit, just so we're kind of all clear where we are, in case anyone's getting a bit distracted and started getting hungry with all this talk about food. <laughs> um, so you're presenting a view, David, which is saying that actually our interpretation of the Old Testament, we've kind of mentioned mostly, and a little bit of the New Testament as well so far, uh, are kind of... A lot of Christians may look at that and say, well, this gives me permission to eat meat, you know, go and go and eat any uh, you know, anything that calls on the land. But you're actually saying that actually, you know, there's maybe a bit of a, a mistranslation or some maybe um, like a, a misunderstanding that actually it's only in for, for a specific situation, a specific time with very strict laws and regulations uh, around it. Um, OK, then. So let's let's focus on the New Testament, um, specifically, maybe this point about the incarnation then kind of moving away from the Old Testament more to the New Testament. So um, we're discussing the incarnation. Uh, you point out that in John one, the quote isn't that God became human, but the word was made and dwelt among us, uh, made flesh. But the fact remains that Jesus was a human being. It says that explicitly in, in Christian theology. You know, he wasn't a hippopotamus. Uh, Karl Barth, who you mentioned, you know, points this out. It's clear that Jesus is uh, exclusively interested in the salvation of human beings. All dogs aren't going to go to heaven. So does this not point to a special place for humans in God's plan? OK, we, we've mentioned this distinctiveness uh, of us. Well, surely one of the most distinctive bits of us is we are given salvation. That is not given to a snail. Um, what have you got to say about this? This kind of, I guess, criticism of your idea? 
So I think um, salvation, a Christian doctrine of salvation is a more than human doctrine. And there are all kinds of uh, ways of beginning to uh, think about why that might look uh, really promising. But So it seems to me, first of all, we shouldn't connect uh, Jesus's uh, humanity with a, an exclusive concern on, on the part of God for humans, um, and that we should think about the connection between uh, salvation and uh, incarnation. So one of the interesting ways this, this was asked in the context of feminist theology is um, can a male savior save women? Mm. So Rosemary Radford Ruther, mm. uh, American feminist uh, theologian, poses that question. And it seems to me that the logic, if you're saying, well, Jesus was human, therefore God was only interested in saving humans, uh, that would, you know, logic would push us towards saying, well, Jesus was male, so therefore could only save males, mm. or mm. Jesus was, and this definitely was an issue in the New Testament, Jesus was Jewish, and therefore mm. God was only interested in saving Jews, and so in the early early church had to deal with, um, you know, rethinking uh, that and uh, all kinds of other ways. You know, Jesus was living at a particular period of time, and therefore God was only interested in saving people at a particular point of time. Would be another mm. quite credible way of interpreting that. I think we we need to pay attention to the fact that. The doctrine of the incarnation in a Christian context is about particularity. So it is about God becoming uh, uh, incarnate in this particular creature, uh, this man uh, named uh, Jesus of Nazareth, who lived at this particular time in this place um, and had these you know, characteristics, it is about particularity. But that particularity, shouldn't we shouldn't understand it as defining the boundaries of uh, salvation. The scandal, I think, of the Christian doctrine of the incarnation is that God becomes incarnate in this just one creature and then that salvific act is relevant for the whole of the universe hmm. uh, and, and and that's the kind of boldness of uh this the statement and so i think bart's wrong um insofar as he is committed to the idea that the incarnation or uh, uh doctrine of salvation are are human uh, specific and there are all kinds of ways we could begin to make the case for a more than human account of uh, creation if we stay within the new testament we have paul's letter to the romans for example Paul, where in Paul, uh, Romans 8, Paul talks about a whole creation groaning in labor pains, uh, awaiting the birth of the new creation and looks forward to the time when creation is going to be liberated from its bondage to decay and will enjoy mm. the freedom of the children of God. Mm. And so Paul seems to you know, share with the authors of the Colossians and Ephesians that I've mentioned this sense that the, the Christ event is, uh, is, is cosmic in scope. It's, the whole crea- it's going to change things for the whole creation, mm. not just for uh, human beings. And then in the book of Revelation, we've got this vision of, you've already referred to Jesus as the lamb we've got this vision of what worship looks like in the new creation and that's uh the lamb standing as if slain surrounded by these four weird human animal hybrid creatures from ezekiel mm. and then by a whole uh, group of uh, human uh, white robe martyrs and then every creature in the in the air and the earth and uh, in the sea you know part of this heavenly throng of worship mm. so it's really strange to me that uh, a lot of christians have thought of um christian doctrine of uh, uh, salvation, redemption, heaven as a sort of mono species kind of thing, mm. uh, or a, uh, even more selective than that. A particular group of humans get get selected to be part of uh, this, uh, you know, God's God's redemption. Because there are all kinds of ways in which um, uh, Christian uh, texts and theological traditions have emphasised salvation needs to be uh, needs to go way beyond the human. So, David, our last question for this section: uh, In his essay, "Didn't Jesus Eat Fish?" which is probably the most common question people have, have asked me when I've said what we're talking to you about today. We said, uh, David Coff's a Christian who thinks that we should all be vegetarian or vegan. Said, Wait a second, isn't, didn't Jesus eat fish? Well, we found an, an essay of, um, of Andy Alexis Baker's, who also it, it's in a, a book which you yourself um, contributed to, so I'm sure you're aware of it. And he discusses this common criticism, refusing to eat meat. Um, contradicts Jesus' own practices who ate fish. I mean, Jesus uh, cooks fish for his disciples. He multiplies fish and bread to feed large crowds. He helps his disciples catch fish. And after his resurrection, he even eats a piece to show that he's returned in bodily form. And um, Andy gives us a, a lots of different responses, like um, maybe he, did, he didn't eat many kosher foods as well. It doesn't mean you shouldn't be... Oh, what's the point here? So he doesn't eat many kosher foods as well. So does that mean that you're not allowed to eat them. If we just eat what Jesus eats, that restricts our diet to a very few things. 
Um, second, maybe it's not normative. Maybe, uh, you know, the church wouldn't ask us, didn't Jesus go barefoot when we arrive at church on a Sunday? Take your shoes off. Get out of your car. Jesus rode a donkey. So he gives some <laughs> some nice, uh, interesting responses. Interestingly, he doesn't like throw um, his hat on any of them and, and go the full full hog, so to speak. Um, I know you know as well uh, Charles uh, Camosi, who the Foreman professor and Catholic, he gave a really interesting response to this. Um, he's gone vegetarian but he still eats fish and the reason not he... anymore he doesn't oh, but doesn't go on. Well, an <laughs> he's quote. vegan now he says quote half because jesus christ ate fish and half because i'm too weak to give up my grandmother's tuna spaghetti <laughs> uh, sauce okay okay well he got stronger <laughs> <laughs> oh his grandmother's food got worse <laughs> yeah. oh, that's quite mean that's harsh, that back. Yeah, yeah. Uh, david what's your response to this uh, this common question then didn't jesus eat fish so, yeah, I think not only did Jesus eat fish, uh, but I think it's also extremely likely that he ate lamb as an observant Jew at Passover. Mm -hmm. It would be very, it would be extraordinary if he didn't, mm -hmm. uh, and a matter of uh, comment. Um, that didn't stop there being early traditions after Jesus' death that Jesus was vegetarian. There's a really, you know, vegetarians is, is this really interesting controversial issue. So James, um, the, you know, one of the church leaders, um, definitely is identified as vegetarian mm -hmm. uh, in early Christian tradition. And as I say, some sects even claim Jesus as vegetarian. I don't think that's plausible, um, but I don't think that's a good reason for Christians not to think seriously about uh, treatment of animals, vegetarianism and veganism in uh, the present. Um, so the the thing for me is that the stories about Jesus I think it make make it really implausible to claim that veganism has always and everywhere been a, you know an absolute demand of mm -hmm. Christianity. It does you know that doesn't feel like a case that I would want to be spending right. uh, any time making. If Christians are going to consider veganism now, I think it's not because of uh, the example of Jesus, um, but because of reflecting on the ways in which our current patterns of raising animals for mm. food have really problematic impacts on humans and animals and the environment. And so I would encourage people to be thinking, um, you know, just like Andy, some, some of Andy's examples, you know, Jesus didn't have to think about cutting his carbon emissions because mm. he wasn't facing the same problem about environmental crisis as we are. Mm -hmm. And so for us to be thinking about, for Christians uh, today to be thinking about their uh, responsibility based on Jesus' teaching might require a different kind of practice. It will require a radically different kind of life um, uh, than Jesus lived. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the idea of, I mean, people do kind of wear these uh, bands saying, what would Jesus do? Mm -hmm. uh, we can't answer that question just in terms of the life that Jesus lived in his day. We'd need to reckon with the fact if, if Jesus was around today, he would be called on uh, to live in a in a different way in dialogue with the crisis that we're we're confronting excellent that's a wonderful uh, way to end that section but before we end this section completely and we've got a little game for the end of our part one here the mystery philosopher uh, so welcome to mystery philosopher david uh, so you're going to be given a quotation from a famous uh, philosopher and you have to guess who the person is giving the quotation um, you can all play along. I think, uh, Ollie, you're definitely going to know it first hand. David, I've got a strong inclination that you'll know who this person is as well. Greg, be interested? Um, <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure why I'm throwing you the bus there. But I'm going to give Greg first dibs on the guess, um, and then I'll open the floor afterwards. Cheap grace means grace sold on the market like cheap jacks wares. The sacraments, the forgiveness of sin, and the consolations of religion are thrown away at cut prices. The essence of grace, we suppose, is that the account has been paid in advance, and, because it has been paid, everything can be had for nothing. Since the cost was infinite, the possibilities of using and spending it are infinite. Now I'm hoping I've played you the right recording, rather than some kind of uh, personal voice memo instead, because <laughs> you all look deeply concerned <laughs> I was playing that back to you. Um, Greg, any guesses who it might be? I have no idea, I'm afraid. That's okay, don't worry. Ollie? Oh, I'm struggling, to be honest. I can't really remember. David? Could it be Dietrich Bonhoeffer? It's Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Ah, I yes. thought you'd we read we spoke very much. I thought that'd be all over. I know, there. sorry. You're being modest, I'm sure. <laughs> that was Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Join us next week. We'll be looking at engaging in some further analysis and discussion and speaking to David Clough more about uh, veganism and Christianity. It's already available on patreon.com forward slash panpsychast. So head over there if you'd like early access. We'll see you next week.
Thank you for joining us for another episode of the Pan Sai Cast. The next instalment of this episode will be available on the following Monday. Patreon subscribers already have access to the latest episode of the Pan Sai Cast. To support the show and get early access to all of the episodes, you can visit us on Patreon. That's www.patreon.com forward slash pansycast. The link is also in the iTunes description. For all the reading and to find out more about the show and get all of the old episodes completely free, you can visit www.thepansycast.com. From all of us here at the Pansycast, thank you for your support and thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. It's been lots of fun. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for listening. Thank you all. I've enjoyed it a lot. Thanks a lot. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye. I really appreciate what you folks are trying to do. That's that was up. great. That was really good. Great. You guys really read up on this. That yeah, was good. Wow. <laughs> that was a lot of fun. You guys uh, managed to combine the banter and the philosophy perfectly, I think. Beautiful. Fantastic. Great. Oh, well done, you guys. Gosh, you're yeah. doing a wonderful thing with this. <laughs>